Let's talk about testing. Some days ago, we learned how to deal with basic testing. If you remember, let me recap. We created a function in JavaScript to evaluate whether a particular student deserved the blue tick or not. So, depending on some conditions, so the user needed to have completed task number 24 on Coldflix and should have an avatar just to, uh, to get the, the blue tick. And on the left hand side, we wrote some tests, if you remember. So if no data was provided, no blue tick. If current task was below 24, no blue tick. If user had no avatar, no blue tick. Otherwise, if user had completed at least task 24 and had the avatar, then get the blue tick. Right? So that's pretty much what we did on the last week. Uh, today, I'd like to show you how to industrialize that. Even though that's fine, if you do that in a job interview, you prove you know how to test, so that's fine. However, however, now it's very easy to improve that by following some basic guidelines. First of all, and the, the reason why I'm explaining that is not only to let you know how to do it right, under my point of view, it's also to invite you to share the same thoughts with the potential employer, because they may be surprised if you prove that know-how. First of all, and I understand that's a common thing in the industry, but I don't really like it, and I can argue why. If you've seen a bit of uh, how people write tests, it's relatively common developers start the test saying should return, should get, should set, should apply, you know, the verb sh should. I hate that. I hate that. Because if you say should, it looks like you are not fully convinced about what you are talking about. Test should be bold, strong, aggressive, if you want. I don't like should return. You either say must return or, to simplify things, returns. It's not should or shouldn't. It just returns, right? You can see it costs nothing to do things right. So return, 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 return all the time. That's the first thing. All right. Now, now looking on the left hand side, how many conditions do we have? How many scenarios? How many possibilities? Four. Yeah, that's correct. But for ignoring the first case where we, got, we don't have any details, whenever we got data, there are four scenarios, right? Why? Because there are two conditions. What's the current task and whether he or she has avatar or not? True, false, false, true, 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 false, false, right? Do you agree on that? At the moment, are we covering all these four scenarios? What happens if the user has the avatar, but he or she is still working on task number four? If returns undefined, no, look. We'll return false, correct. If we look at the, on the right hand side, we know it will work. However, we shouldn't need to look at the right hand side to make sure that all the possibilities are covered. And according to my test, I don't know if a user with avatar true and task four will get the blue tick or not. How do I know that? Yeah, it's unknown. We don't know. May work, may not work, but we don't have any scenario where we test both possibilities. That's the only scenario, true, true, right? The last one. If both conditions are truthy, we know it will return true. But on the negative cases, we're partially covered. But we don't know what happened. Look, 
that's 23. But what if the user has the avatar? And on the other way around, what happens if he doesn't have the avatar, but he has completed 92 tasks, 100 tasks? What happened? We don't know. Because of that, we want to test every single possibility. Because otherwise, we may introduce a bug, a glitch into the system because we are not testing it. We, no one knows, right? All right, so how do we do that? Of course, we can copy and paste the test and change the data model a bit. We can do that, no problem. But at some point, this is going to be exhausting because in here we only have two options. But in reality, to get the blue tea, you get like seven or eight combinations. So if you get eight combinations, it's a lot, a lot of possibilities. How many? Two pow eight or something like that, right? Which is 128, something like that. So how do we simplify things? I strongly recommend you, whenever you have tests with a similar structure, because you can see that the structure of the test is the same. You prepare a data model, an object, and then you call a function, and the function returns true or false. Yeah. So it's always the same structure. Whenever you got that, I advise to unroll the tests. What unrolling means? Create an array of scenarios. Look, an array, right? It, look at what I'm doing. You can see, I can uh, play with the uh, data model, so I can play with all the scenarios, and then expect true or false on the Hasbolitic function. What that means? Look, I can use for each. I like to call it a scenario because this is an a scenario. And then, can you tell me what do I need to replace on lines number nine, ten, and eleven? Yep. Um, what else? Anything else? Correct. That's correct. You see, we are making a dynamic test. We are changing the title of the test. We are also changing the data model with user information. And finally, we are changing the expectation. Why this is so beneficial? Because now, look at what can we do. We can add more elements to the array. What was the second one? Returns false if task 24 is not completed yet. Let's do that. So what's the data model? Has avatar true? Return false. Likewise, let's add the third scenario. So what's the third scenario? Let me copy the second one. The third scenario means returns false if the user has no avatar. So for now, I'm not adding any new test, as you can see. I'm just refactoring my tests. Uh, oh, sorry, that was wrong. So that was, uh, I copied the wrong one, current task, 23. The third one was has no avatar. And then we got the last one where both conditions are met. So let me add the last test where, again, I'm just copy and pasting what we did a few days ago. I'm just moving things around. You see, both conditions are met. Has the blue take what? True. True, correct. So now, 
Let's see if the tests pass or not. Yeah, they do pass. That's the same code. I haven't added any logic, but I hope you agree with me that now it's much easier to add new elements to the array. This reminds me, and we were talking about this morning on the stand-up, about call flicks. Do you remember when you hard-coded the list of TV shows in HTML? Then you created an array. It was much easier to add new movies on an array than on the HTML. That's the same thing. It's much easier to add new scenarios on the array than on separate tests. Do you agree on that? All right, so then let's complete that. Look, returns false. The first one is okay. We got no data model. But the second one, returns false if task 24 is not completed yet and user has no avatar. Sorry. Avatar is, no, has avatar. Has avatar false, right? Likewise, likewise, let's add another scenario. Returns false. If task 24 is completed, but user has no avatar. I'm on task number 91. You see, I finish call flicks, but I don't have any avatar. Return false. And on the other case, returns false if the user has no, uh, let's check that. So 23, 91, false, false. Right, so returns false. Right, let me, let me remove that. That happens when you add many tests. Sometimes it's a bit complicated to have the big picture. So we got false, false, true, false. So we need false, false, of course, right? So returns false if task 24 is not completed yet and user has no avatar. So that's the most pessimistic scenario, right? You haven't satisfied any of the expectations. So again, uh, no, actually we did that here. Look, false, false, true, false, this is false, false, the same test. So that should be false, true, yeah, correct. Returns false if that's 24 is completed and Sorry, it's a bit confusing. Uh, if that 24 is not completed, yet, comma, even if he has avatar. We can rename that after was a bit. But the important thing is to cover all the cases. Again, false, false, true, false, false, true. What else do we need? False, true. False true is here. True true is here. Is there anything missing? Not really. Because we got two power two scenarios. True true. <laughs> true false. <laughs> so it's completely mind blowing, but I hope you get the idea, right? <laughs> Probably not the best words for a Friday afternoon. I want you to cover all the scenarios, all the possibilities. And now you can ask me, all right, but look, with the avatar, it's true or false, right? Two options. But with call flicks, we have a hundred options. One, two, three, four, five. What do we do? The thing is, will the logic change? depending on whether we're on task number one or 13? Not at all. Exactly, exactly. I, yeah, I agree with Parik. So where is the cut? Where is the line? It's on 24, so that's what we need to test. Sometimes, sometimes, when we deal with things like smaller, smaller equal, sometimes I think it's okay to add extra tests. So for instance, I may accept I think I get a test on 23, 24, and 25. It's just to prove the, the boundaries, the hot part of the, of the code, yeah? But keep it simple. Don't test 100 times because that's pointless, yeah? 
So that's the way you test every single scenario. The more complex the function is, obviously the more scenarios you need. Does it make sense? Do we have test coverage? Do you remember I talked about Istanbul yeah. last week? Uh, I think, and I may be wrong, you can pass a does the coverage flag. Uh, no, not really. I think there was a way to run it. Let me go to Google quickly. Um, and, uh, create React app test coverage. I think that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was with test coverage. Look. Empty. Oh, we need to pass. Look, be careful with that. Yeah, double double has, and then uh, the syntax is a bit weird, right? Let's be careful with these things. All right, let's run it again. Let's see if we get any coverage. It's running. Yes, here we go. As you can see, as you can see, we got many untested files, but that makes sense because I got many files in my Coldflix repo that hasn't been tested yet. That's why you got so many red lines. However, pay attention to that line. Look at how sexy this is. It's telling me that the blue tick JS is perfectly tested. You can see, you can test how many functions you've tested, how many lines, many things, right? So what happened, guys, if I, for instance, let's remove, uh, let's remove the last test, the test where you get the blue tick. The only test where has blue tick function returns true. Let's remove it and see if the coverage tool reports something. Oh, I, did, I stopped the test, sorry. I need to run does does watch, watch the thing. In theory, it shouldn't say that all my lines have been tested because line number nine, that now is untested. We are never asserting the function return true. Let's have a look. Look, it's pretty cool. You can see that even though, I'm not sure if you can see anything, even though all my functions have been tested, look at lines, you see? Percent of lines tested, 85%. It's not 100 anymore. If we add that test back, you see, now the test is back, let's see what happened. Should be fully tested, look, perfect. That's pretty cool, right? Because we can see, does that mean that if we have covered 100% of the lines, the code will never fail? Not really, right? That means that we have a test for every single line. But what happened, and that's a common scenario, that the business analyst requires new feature but there is a misunderstanding between that person and us. Business wants to change the background color to blue, but we understand that she wants to change it to green. And we add a test that says the background color is green, and the test passes because the background color is green. It works as designed, but not as expected. Yeah? So again, this is not rocket science. This doesn't mean the code will never fail. But, but that gives you a good feeling about the quality of the software. If you join a project where the test coverage is zero, this is likely to fail. If you join a project where test coverage is, you'll never join a project where test coverage is 100%. But if it's something decent, 70, 75, 80, 
at least that proves that developers they look after. Yeah. Some guys, that's not a common rule, but some people believe that testing is a waste of time. Never say that in a job interview because they'll never hire you, right? But some people genuinely believe that. And their point of, their point of view is, generally speaking, you spend at least, at least 50% of the time testing or even more. So what they think is, I don't want to do that. I don't want to waste 50% of my time. So I'll be able to build more features because instead of spending half of my day testing, I'll take the time box to build more features, right? So yes, code may fail, but if it fails, I'll fix it. It's controversial. It's controversial. And it's, it's a point of view, right? Um, you know, also, lack of testing is common when people build a prototype. So uh, now we're in touch with some uh, investors. And what they say is that, generally speaking, when someone wants to get money for the software, they show a prototype, mock-up, something dirty. Obviously, this is not tested at all, right? Because this is, that code will be thrown. If they get the money, probably they'll start from scratch and they will build everything in a, in a good way. Again, a classic job interview question is, what do you think about testing? That's up to you, right? Sell your honest feelings. But if you want to get the job, probably what you want to tell the employer is that you like testing because it goes, helps to make sure that the quality of the product is the appropriate. It's also good in terms of refactoring. Because for instance, I'll tell you something, what happened if by accident, by accident, I remove that line, line number nine. If I don't have any tests, I will notice the error, right? The code will go to production and then no one will get the blue tick. But if I do have a test, at least, whoa, one test is failing, what happened? It's a red flag. At least we can investigate what the problem is. Does it make sense? Right. So, yes, a couple of more things in regards to that test. I'm missing something. So you see, you remember this IT is the way we create a new test, but we can also group tests. How do we group a test? Correct. We can put, we can call a function called describe. With describe, we can specify what, what, what's the purpose of that component. So, has blue tick checks whether a user has the blue tick or not, something like that. And then inside of the describe log, as Richard said, then we nest, we encapsulate all our complexity. So why this is useful? I'll show you. Because in, real, in a real product, you may have thousands of tests and one day test number 479 will fail what is that test could be complicated sometimes however look at the bottom you see the test reporter tells you the functionality that has failed that's why describe is so important we can even nest multiple describes. So you can have a describe inside of another describe. But at least, I believe, every test file should have a root describe function. And one more thing. That's the last thing. Well, two more things, actually. First of all, what we've done here is TDD, test-driven development. Means we've been testing something and then we've implemented the functionality. Have you ever heard about BDD? Behavior driven development. So BDD is a fork, if you accept the expression of TDD, where in theory, in a romantic world, the idea is 
You remember, I put the example of the business analyst that has a list of requirements. How do we tell the business analyst that her expectations have been accomplished? Because the code will go to an environment and she will be able to play on that environment. But don't you think it would be ideal if business analysts will have access to that code, to that test, to see if what she or he had on the mind was ref reflected in here, right? So this is BDD. Try to make the test more readable, understandable for non-technical people. And how do we do that? I mean, I'll tell you something, that never worked for me because it doesn't matter how readable, this is code and non-coders doesn't understand code, right? It's what it is. But at least we can improve that a bit with something called the triple A. Arrange, act, assert. Or you may have heard about that like given, when, then. So given, when, then means given I have this data, when I call that function, then I expect that result. You, ex you express the flow of your functionality. Look at how, we can, how can we orchestrate that. Given a command, right? Let data model equals scenario dot data model. It's like the setup, right, of the test. Given I got that data model, when, when what? What should we put here? What's the action? Correct. When we call the function, we can do something like that. Then, what? Correct. Expect result to be a scenario dot has blue tick. That's probably a bit more readable, given when then. Any questions? Yeah. So the given arrange when act and then assert triple A. Depending on the context, they will use one or the other, but it's the same, right? Sometimes there is a fourth one, clean up, I don't know. It's, it's not rocket science, it's just the idea of structuring the test in a more readable way. Um, yeah, so all these things are about unit testing. Unit testing is the most fundamental way of test your code. You create a function, you invoke the function, and you check the value. This is the most fundamental, the most pretty important, a bit controversial, but in my opinion, it's probably the most important part of testing. However, however, does anyone know any other type of testing apart from unit testing? I'll show you a diagram. When we talk about testing, first of all, well, to be honest, first, 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 first of all, we got things like linting, what linting is. Do you know the Elegance console on the Kodiri platform? Elegance, that's linting. Linting means semicolons, spaces, wrong indentation, all these things, right? That's a sort of testing. We evaluate the code, right? The quality of the code. So we got linting, we got unit testing. Then you may have heard about something called component testing. So unit testing is JavaScript training. Component testing is React training, where you test is some sort of unit test, but there is some sort of user interaction, right? You've seen on the React training, we've got forms, inputs, button, 
We are simulating a browser, but we don't have any browser. Why component? Because we test React components. Then we go things like functional testing. Functional testing means we open a real browser and we have a bot that clicks around on the screen. Have you seen this? Uh, what cap you know what CAPTCHA is? The Google CAPTCHA, you have to click to prove that you're a human. So this is to prevent from functional testing robots, right? Because we can automatize. I'll, I'll let you know some tooling if you want to investigate a bit further. So when talking about linting, we got things like JS hint or the more strict JS lint, but they are about the same thing, right? Unit testing. Unit testing involves tools like Jasmine, like Mocha, like Sinon, Stabs for mocking data. I know that some of this stuff sounds like Chinese. The reason why I'm referring to them is because I hope everyone agree testing is very important. And the message is you need to do testing on every job interview. So please start testing components the sooner the better. I'll go to Ensign in a minute. Yes, I'll talk about Ensign in a minute. Talking about component testing, we got things like Jest. So when I run npm run test, this is running Jest out of the box. It's like the Facebook framework to test React components. It's not the only option, but one of the most popular ones. And then, functional testing. Yes, we got things like Enzyme. Dot js we use that at Codery. It's a fantastic library. So Ensign starts a browser, could be headless, or could be a real browser, and clicks around. Yeah, it's very popular. And one of the reasons why it's very popular is because it's completely written in JavaScript. Not that far ago, the only way to test applications, you needed such a complex infrastructure to install things like WebDriver, Selenium, it was a pain in the ass. Now, in the last couple of years, that got massively simplified. Yeah, Ensign, which is a bunch of two or three people, they got last month $9.4 million to keep working on the product. That's the future. We also got something called Test Cafe, very popular as well. I prefer Ensign. I think it's very, very easy to start working with. Uh, then we got end-to-end -end testing or integration testing. Does anyone know the difference between functional testing and integration testing? It's, it's the same, actually. The tools are the same. The test may be the same, more or less. Ah, uh, yeah, no, you are not far away. Yeah, it's, it's quite close. Yeah, that's pretty much it. The main thing, the main difference is when we do functional testing, we don't attack any real data. We only test the UI, like conflicts locally. We don't attack any database, fake data. When we do end-to-end -end testing or integration testing, we do attack a node backend, we do attack a database. We, we imitate the user, right? But the, the test is the same. Check that the page loads and it displays six TV shows. That, that assertion is valid for functional end-to-end. -end. The main difference is on functional, we will be attacking a mock database. With integration, we will be attacking a back-end, more real scenario. And now we got a very new thing, which is CSS testing also called visual regression testing. This is UI training, that's, that's super new. 
visual recursion means go to that page, take a screenshot, and save it. So every time I deploy new code to the cloud, take a new screenshot of the same page and compare them. If the screenshots are the same, that's okay. But if I, by mistake, I broke the UI, yeah, I change the background color to pink, the screenshot, the diff, will report the problem. So this is very experimental, but that's the future. Because that doesn't care if we are using React, Angular, just take screenshots, literally screenshots, UI training, right? And then you got backstop.js. It's very, very nice. This is the classic things that, of course, no one will ask you in a job interview because no one expects that. But if you can play a bit you, and you can prove you've been playing with that, that's super valuable because I'm sure that 99% of the companies, first of all, they don't have that. And the majority of them, they will be absolutely keen to introduce that as part of their stack. So that gives you a big plus, a big bonus on the hiring process. Backstop. So that's the pyramid, the testing pyramid. So imagine that we have a real product and we want to execute all these tests. In which order should we run them? Does it matter at all? So you said it wants a first functional, then end to end, and then what? And then you need All right, I'll give you a hint. The hint is, let's see how long, how long each step may take to complete. So linting may take 0 0.5 seconds. Unit testing may take five seconds. Component testing may take 50 seconds. Functional testing may take 200 seconds. No, that's not 50, that's not true, maybe 10. Functional testing, I mean, this is just finger in the air, right? But it gives you the scale. End-to-end -end testing may take 150 seconds. And CSS testing may take 250 seconds. Any thoughts? Correct, top bottom. Why? Because we want to follow a file, no, how is that? F f Fail, fail fast, fail fast strategy. That means that if something fails, the sooner the better, right? Imagine that we start bottom to top. We waste 10 minutes and then everything fails because we forgot to add a semicolon in the code. Oh. So top, bottom, always first linting, then unit, yeah? The quicker the task is, the sooner it should be executed. Anything else? No? Again, testing. At least unit testing will happen as part of a job interview. On every single cohort, someone gets rejected because fail on the unit test stage. Should prove that you should do testing. The more, the better. Thank you, guys.